In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and with respect for the traditional custodians of this land, the Gadigal people and elders past and present. When the wine gave out, too loud now, aren't I? Thanks, Stretch. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Well, here we are at one of the driest times of the year. And today is the day our lectionary chooses to present us with the story of Jesus the winemaker. I mean, some people refer to this whole month as dry January, as it's our period of recovery after the silly season. I mean, some of us get more silly than others over the Christmas period, of course. And some of us let the frivolity extend right into the first few weeks of January as we take the kids away and sun ourselves on various beaches and continue to consume far more alcohol than either our livers or our credit cards can handle. We drink like prince. Let's drink like prince rather than drink like princes, meaning... We can pay more than $50 a bottle, yet party like it's 1999. Either way, by this time of the month, we're starting to sober up. Surely, the school holidays are coming to an end. Even the most softly amongst us is being drawn back into the workplace. And yet now is the time when Jesus brings out the good wine, saving the best things till last, right at the end of the party. I mean, it, it, it is odd timing, I think, when you consider that the lectionary readings at the moment are all from the Gospel of Luke. I think the church probably inserted this reading from the Gospel of John here because we're in Epiphany. It's the season of revelation. And uh, at the end of this reading, we're told that Jesus revealed his glory through this miracle. And, and then what an odd way for Jesus to choose to reveal himself and exactly what aspect of his glory was he supposed to be revealing through this miracle anyway? You know, that he's the source of unending streams of alcohol? I mean, I don't mean that as a flippant question either. For in the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus' miracles are referred to as signs of the kingdom as their, their concrete illustrations of the message that Jesus is preaching. Jesus is proclaiming the coming of the kingdom of God, uh, you know, an age where there will be no more violence, death or disease. And he illustrates his message through the signs that he shows of the, what the new world is going to look like. You know, the blind see because there's no more blindness in the kingdom of God. And lepers are cleansed because there's no leprosy in the kingdom of God. And the dead are raised because death itself will be no more in Jesus' kingdom. But if this miracle too is a sign of what is to come, what's it saying about the new world? That the alcohol never stops flowing? I mean, if so, I think some of our Baptist brethren are going to find this difficult to cope with. I mean, personally, I have no problem with the image of the kingdom of God like this. Even so, we run the risk of trivialising the passage, I think, and, and missing what the gospel writer is trying to say to us if we reduce the whole message to one about the kingdom of God being a non-stop party. I mean, it is a party, surely, but there's surely a lot more going on at that party than just drinking. I mean, we're in the Gospel of John, and John is a book with a lot of levels to it. And there are often a lot of double meanings and hidden messages. And I'm not suggesting there are any sort of scandalous truths hidden in code anywhere, as, as the authors of the Da Vinci Code might have us believe, but rather that I think John, as the last of the Gospels written, was crafted very artistically, and you often need to read through John's words multiple times to get their full meaning. I mean, this is the Gospel where Jesus speaks of the wind blows where it will, 
and he's really talking about the movement of the Spirit of God and it's easy to get confused and likewise he speaks about flowing water or was that living water and is he speaking again about the Spirit? Well, yes, he is. And it's interesting, those who've looked for hidden meanings in this particular passage have often done so by starting with parallels between this miracle story and some of the ancient myths from the Greek uh, myths about the Greek gods, particularly Dionysius, who was, uh, we probably know better by his Roman name, Bacchus, the god of wine. I mean, Bacchus, god of wine, was very adept at turning water into wine. And interestingly, too, uh, he, or at least Dionysius, was supposed to be the result of a virgin birth, and his birthday was celebrated on December the 25th. Uh, this, of course, has led any number of uh, people to suggest that the, the church simply stole the story about Jesus from the midst of Dionysius. Uh, but that's, that's hardly likely. I mean, uh, lots of Greek and Roman gods and demigods were the results of virgin births, or at least the results of strange sexual encounters between the gods above and mortal women who fell victim to their lusts. Uh, and when it comes to December the 25th, uh, the reason the Greeks and the Romans celebrated Dionysius' birthday uh, on that day was probably the same reason Constantine decided to celebrate Jesus' birthday on that day in the year 388, uh, namely uh, not because anybody thought it was really anybody's birthday, but it was the beginning of the winter solstice and it was a good time to celebrate. I mean, in terms of the miracle of water into wine, though, you know, is the gospel writer here subtly trying to let his Greek and Roman readers know that anything their gods can do, Jesus can do better? I mean, that's possible, but, you know, it's hard to be clear about anything like this in John's gospel. The wind blows where it will, and your imagination can sort of blow where it will when you read this too. I, mean, I, I want to add at this point that I really believe that any similarities between the gospel stories and the ancient myths of Greece and Rome, um, I really believe are, are purely superficial. And I believe that not simply because of dissimilar, dissimilarities within the stories themselves, but because of the roles those stories played in their respective societies. I mean, the thing about the, the myths of the ancient religions, we call the pagan religions of Greece and Rome, is that nobody was particularly concerned whether those stories were historical. I mean, I'm sure some of the worshippers felt that, you know, there might have been some basis in history. For, it, it wasn't the point. The, the way you participated in the religious life uh, was by doing the sacrifices, you know. Uh, there was no concept of orthodoxy, right belief, in the, the ancient religions of Greece and Rome. It's interesting, the whole concept of orthodoxy really begins with Christianity, uh, where all of a sudden it becomes very important what you believe, because there was a strong belief within the early church that what happened, literally happened to the historical Jesus was very important. And for that reason, I think, frankly, we're on much firmer ground when we sort of allow our imaginations to start to sort of work with the Gospel of John, when we look for connections within the New Testament itself and, and within the Gospel of John itself. And there's plenty of room for that sort of thinking too. For, for instance, when John says in, in this passage, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee. Is there some double meaning to third day? I mean, read the first chapter of John. He hasn't been counting days up to this point. You know, is the third day a subtle reference to the resurrection? Connecting what happens here at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus to what happens at the end, the crucifixion and resurrection? Possibly, because that connection is made more explicit by the really odd dialogue Jesus has with his mother. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. He said to the woman, what concern is that 
of you to you and me. My hour has not yet come. It sounds very disrespectful, doesn't it, woman? Uh, it's, that's, that's not the case. Uh, it's made clear that there's only two references to Mary in, in the uh, Gospel of John, and she's referred to as woman by him both times. Uh, the second reference is at the foot of the cross. Uh, near the cross of Jesus, now in John 19, stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clothas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. Now, I mean, some translate both references as, as dear woman. Uh, because it's, it's obvious in the second example, uh, especially that Jesus is speaking to his mother with tenderness. I mean, even so, the exchange in Cana is a mysterious one, and the mysterious statement of Jesus, my hour has not yet come, connects this early scene to the later one. For some reason, Jesus sees his mother's invitation to do something about the wine as being the beginning of the end. I mean, why is that? Is there something going on here between Jesus and his mother that's not obvious? Is there something about wine that has special significance to Jesus? Is there something in the water, so to speak? I mean, I actually think the water is, is the key element here. As we're told quite explicitly, there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding around 100 litres. And the water in these jars is not for drinking, not as water, let alone as wine. The water was, was holy water of sorts, used to make people ready for worship. I mean, the Torah strictly regulated uh, how you had to purif purify yourself uh, before you came to pray. And, and you'd rinse your hands in this water symbolically, you know, washing away your sins so you could be close to God. I mean, it's holy water that Jesus takes charge of. Water that's meant to purify people and bring them closer to God. And he turns this into something radically different and then he makes it available for everybody to drink. Now, I, I'm not going to start making connections here between water and wine and blood and the cross and the Eucharist but evidently Jesus sees some of these connections and evidently I think John the gospel writer sees some of these connections too. I mean exactly how you connect all these things I don't hazard to guess but I mean this is John's gospel and perhaps you're not meant to figure it all out. Now, forgive me if I'm overworking the brain this morning, you know, venturing off into Greek mythology and exploring convoluted connections between the beginning and the end of John's Gospel. I mean, as a preacher, the, the danger in preaching like this is everyone checks out, if you haven't checked out already. It's about as long as most people's concentration can last. I mean, as for me, with all the hits I've taken to the head, mine lasts about half this long. Even so, I want to make one more point. And Because there's something in this passage too which is really obvious and doesn't require any subtle guesswork or intricate knowledge of the text. And I think it's still really important. It's just the fact that this is a really big miracle that results in lots of wine. I mean, we're told there were six massive jars each holding around 100 litres of water and Jesus quite explicitly tells the staff, fill the jars with water. And we're told they fill them up to the brim, which means you've got at least 600 litres of liquid. Now, if you think in terms of wine for the party, you know, if that were then sort of uh, bottled in 750 ml bottles, which is the standard size, I mean, that's going to go a long way around, you know, between 100, even 200 guests at the party. That's a good 10, 5 to 10 bottles each. But the figures don't look even more extreme when you think of this liquid in terms of being holy water. 
you know, washing away sins. I mean, the Torah, as I say, is quite explicit about this, and apparently in terms of this purification ritual, you only need one cup of this water to purify a hundred people. Now, I, I didn't bother attempting to do the maths because the figures get quite astronomical, but if you, but that may have been part of John's point, that what Jesus has done here is create enough holy liquid to cleanse the sins of the whole world. I mean, of course, Jesus acting on a crazy large scale like this is nothing new. When Jesus goes fishing, there are more fish than any of the nets are able to hold. When Jesus organises lunch for a crowd, there's so much food left over, it fills a dozen baskets. Jesus provides, and Jesus provides abundantly, especially perhaps for those who follow the instruction given by his mother, do whatever he tells you to do. I mean, that's a useful thing to be reminded of this time of year especially, I think. You know, in this dry January, when Yuletide merriment has all but frittered away and been replaced with the sober contemplation of the credit card bills, Jesus provides. You know, when friends and family have all gone home and we're coming to terms with being alone again, Jesus provides. And most significantly, as we continue to struggle with our own weaknesses and we watch things collapsing around us and feel the weight of our own sin and failures pressing in upon us, Jesus provides. I mean, there is plenty of wine to go round. Nobody needs to be left out. If you're feeling like you've run your race and it's all too much and you can't go on any further, then grab yourself a glass and break open another bottle. It's all good. We've saved the best of last. I appreciate some might find that imagery uncomfortable, if not offensive. And indeed, many of us might find John's gospel in, impenetrable. Even so, this is how Jesus chose to reveal his glory and his disciples believed in him.